The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Um, I apologize, but we are having a little bit of technical difficulty, so just give us one second. We want to make sure we are recording this presentation for folks who were not able to join us today. All right, it looks like we've got that resolved. So thanks for your patience and thanks so much for joining us today uh, for our webinar, Restorative Practices, The Game Changer for Accountability. We're so appreciative of our webinar sponsor, National Professional Resources Incorporated, also known as NPR. NPR is a leader in education publishing since 1968 and is committed to the mission of advancing the success of all learners through supporting the educators who serve them. Before we begin the webinar, I'll review just a few quick housekeeping items. We will be accepting questions throughout the webinar and we'll hold a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You can send your questions in anytime throughout the webinar using the questions feature in your control panel. Type your question into the top box and then push send and I'll get your question and I'll put it into the queue to be answered during that Q&A period. If you experience any technical difficulties during the presentation, please use the questions feature to get my attention and I'll do my best to resolve the problem for you. Um, as I mentioned earlier with our technical difficulty, uh, we will be sharing a recording of the webinar and the presentation slides with you. So keep an eye on your email inbox either tomorrow or Friday for details on how to access those materials. The uh, webinar recording and slides will be posted to the NPR website. Um, so if you, for whatever reason, don't find that email in your inbox in the next day or so, you can also go out to the website and find it there. Now let's get started. I am very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Rufus Lott III, who's founder of Lott Educational Consultants. Prior to founding Lott Educational Consultants, Rufus was the assistant principal of Edward H. White Middle School in San Antonio, Texas. There he played an instrumental role in the development and implementation of restorative practices as an alternative method for managing student behavior. This innovative whole school approach was the first of its kind in the state of Texas and has been considered the blueprint that many campuses across the state are following. Today as lead consultant for Lot Educational Consultants, Rufus teaches restorative practices to teachers and administrators as an alternative method to exclusion and as a means to build positive relationships and strong communities. Rufus received both his bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Texas at San Antonio. He graduated as a member of the Urban School Leadership Cohort, which is a nationally recognized cohort that prepares educational leaders for principalship. He is the author of Restorative Practices, an outside-the-box approach to building and sustaining relationships, a laminated guide that's been published by NPR. We're really pleased to have Rufus with us today to share his expertise and experiences around restorative practices. So Rufus, are you ready to dive in? I am ready. Thank you, Emily, for the uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you to everybody who's joined us today. Um, this is a little different for me. Uh, normally, I um, uh, am used to speaking in uh, conference halls or at schools and speaking with individuals face to face. Um, and so this is a first for me, just like everyone else. But I'm excited um, for the medium and I'm excited that we can get together as a, uh, a community of educators across the nation in one space. Um, and learn from one another. And so thank you, Emily, for that. I really appreciate it. So let's kind of get into it and uh, see where we end up. So um, she so gave you a little bit about myself, but, but I did spend 12 years in public education, both at the elementary and middle school um, level as a uh, middle school administrator, as well as a teacher. Um, here recently, I did find, uh, I was, I'm a founder of Lot Educational Consulting, um, and we've been traveling uh, the United States teaching restorative practices, um, but also putting uh, relationships um, at the center of everything and getting people to think differently about how we should be working with our kids day in and day out in our schools. And so thinking about that and putting it all together, I, I wanted to open up today's uh, webinar with this quote from Aristotle. And he says this, those who educate children, well, they're to be more honored than those who produce them. For those only gave them life, but those who teach them, um, we play, the biggest role. And I read an article here recently said that teachers are the first responders to poverty, we're the first responders to um, health um, and, and sickness and wellness in schools. And so we play a very instrumental role. And so I want, really wanted to start off by just saying thank you. Um, thank you for being dedicated to this profession. Um, it, 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 a lot of people don't really understand the, the hardships. A lot of people don't really understand the things that we go through um, with, te with, with teaching school or being part of the school system. Um, but I want to say thank you. Thank you for, for dedicating your life to this profession because there's a kid out there who's grateful that you chose to do this 
um, day in and day out. So thank you with that. So what, what, you, what we can expect um, for the next 35 or 40 minutes um, is pretty much this. I, I'd like to do uh, what it is and what it's not with restorative practices. So a little bit of RP 101. And then I'd like to take um, you through a brief overview of the care components um, to restorative practices. And so thinking about the care components, let me make the screen a little bigger for you. Thinking about the care components, one second, do like this. Thinking about the care components, um, care is an acronym for CIRCLE, effective language, the relationship agreement, and ultimately emotional intelligence. And so those are the things that we'll explore when we talk about the proactive part of restorative practices. Um, towards the end, we'll explore a little bit about the correct and consequence phase that makes this a whole um, three-step process. And then uh, talk a little bit about a few simple tips for school implementation um, on the back end. And so I wanna start here. In schools, this is a big word, differentiation. Well, what is the power of differentiation? So I want us to consider something for a second. Um, if, if you teach English language arts, you know that kids come to us at various levels of reading. You got kids who are very high level readers, you have kids who are low level readers, and you have kids who come to us who are just in the middle. Um, but we recognize that as a teacher, it's our job to get them to grow. And so when I think about the power of differentiation, um, we'll do everything under the sun to make sure a kid grows. But when you think about differentiation, there's actually two sides to the coin. And when you think about the two sides to the coin, um, we have to consider that the differentiation piece um, is really what matters. And so thinking about differentiation, George Evans says this, every student can learn just not in the same day or the same way. And so truly restorative practices, the way that I've come to understand it and come to define it is pretty simple. It's just a differentiated relational approach to managing student uh, behavior proactively as well as reactively. And so thinking about that flip or the two sides of the coin, most of the time we think of academics when we think of differentiation, but there's another side to it, which is behavior. And so typically when we think about um, behavior, we don't think about the things that we have to do in order to differentiate with our students. And so when you think about differentiation, it is two sides to the coin. And so we can't just focus on differentiating and meeting their needs academically, but for our kids who struggle the most, we've got to differentiate in behavior as well. And so you'll hear words like individualization and you'll hear words like differentiation um, throughout the presentation. And so when you think about academics as, as an educator, as an administrator, as teachers, we'll do all the things there on the left side um, um, under the sun to make things happen for our kids and meet their needs academically. But when you think about behavior, that's like the dark side. And typically we give our kids one more chance. We assume willful disobedience. Um, and eventually, um, if they can't conform to our expectations, we sort of tell them that they don't belong. And later on in the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about how belonging is such a pivotal thing when it comes down to this process and creating those environments for our kids. And so if we were to break it down, because restorative practices or restorative justice is known as different things in different parts of the country, it's this huge umbrella. And so we've taken it and we've kind of broken it down into a way where um, our administrators and our teachers have um, exact roles so that we know exactly what it is that we're doing and we're playing our role to the best effect for our kids. And so thinking about proactive measures, most of the time things that are proactive are happening in the classroom. And so what we're asking from our teachers, um, more importantly, is that they continue to build environments where relationships, trust, empathy, and a sense of belonging runs rampant in those classrooms. Those are the environments that we want for our kids to feel as though they belong. And the more that we can get our kids to feel as though that they belong, the more they're going to want to be with us at school and perform to our expectations. But on the backside, restorative practices brings on a whole other world of accountability. And we call that the reactive side. And so this is going to give us our opportunity to work through our kids to help them reach meaningful accountability when it comes down to repairing relationships. And so thinking about it and putting it all together, um, I chose my words very carefully when we created this, this definition. It says, this process serves as the platform for meaningful accountability with an attempt to dismiss exclusionary consequences and to avoid zero tolerance policies. And I think that's very important because there's a lot of models right now out in the nation that say this process um, is the anti-consequence uh, program or is the anti-zero tolerance program. And I, and I tend to um, have a different outlook on it and a different argument, and this is why. To me, zero tolerance is a great thing, 
um, in its inception. You know, thinking about looking at the legislation in layman's terms, um, zero tolerance just really means if there is a breach to the student code of conduct, um, there must be a reaction to it. And so thinking about leading a campus or thinking about being a principal on a campus right now, um, I would most definitely have zero tolerance for fighting, most definitely have zero tolerance for disrespect or profanity or all the things that we're dealing with. Um, we should have those high expectations and we have to teach those expectations. The crazy thing that what we did with zero tolerance is we sort of uh, perverted the legislation and we predetermined all the consequences. And so that's sort of kind of why we're in a situation now where if we don't do something, then disappointment on the back end um, persists because there's an expectation and we put ourselves in this box by predetermining all the consequences and it leaves us um, kind of filling the gap on the back end because we recognize that those consequences aren't necessarily meeting the needs of our kids and therefore they're not changing their behavior because it's, the system isn't set up a way for them to be held accountable. And so when you think about consequences, um, you know, there's a lot of models out, that, out in, in, in the nation that say that uh, this is the anti-consequence program. And I think that's one of the biggest fears when people are trying to come to this model or try to lead this from a, a whole school approach is that um, people are very apprehensive because there's this misnomer, or this misconception that consequences are going by the wayside. Um, in the model that I've developed, it's, it, it, consequences live side by side. The difference is that we cannot predetermine all of the consequences. Just like we don't predetermine all of the things that we do in differentiation with our students, we've got to give the opportunity for our uh, students to seek meaningful accountability, but it may look different in different ways. And so if we are going to give a consequence, which we're going to talk about here in a bit, it's got to be meaningful and it's got to be logical. It's got to, be, it's got to make sense for the situation and we can't just do things to do things. And so when you think about this process in terms of it being a, uh, a process in three phases, that very first phase is that connection phase. It's the connection phase and we're hoping that in the classroom um, that, that lives very prevalently. We want our teachers to be building relationships strongly with our kids so that they know each other and so that that sense of belonging is there in the classroom. But on the back end, because kids are going to mess up, things are going to happen, uh, relationships are going to be violated, this gives them an opportunity to seek meaningful uh, accountability through a correct phase, which we're going to talk about later. And then ultimately, it sets us up to a point where we can deal with the situation with all the data that we have, um, and then we can kind of blend that over into deciding, is a consequence necessary? And is that consequence ultimately going to be meaningful? And is that consequence ultimately going to be logical? But if you think about it, if you're, in, uh, if you think about how we kind of split this up, and as far as phases, um, the connect phase really happens with the teachers in the classroom. Um, all of those care components, um, being proactive and using those measures in the classroom, I think that's where it, it has to begin. I would argue that 90 to 95 percent of the issues that come to our offices as administrators start with the teacher and a breakdown in relationship in the classroom. And so when you think about connecting in the classroom, well. Our roles as far as administrators happen on the reactive side to things. And so eventually our administrators help our teachers get through the phase of the correction phase and then ultimately our administrators who are responsible for dealing with consequences or reacting to, to situations now um, have a blueprint for uh, responding to a situation in, differ in differentiation. But thinking of it this way, right now our current system of discipline um, sets us up to do things backwards. And so when you think about doing things backwards, typically what we're doing right now in schools is that we're giving the consequence first and we're hoping that that consequence fixes the behavior. And so what I'm saying through the way the process is written, we're going we're gonna to connect first, then we're going to figure out how to correct the situation. And then based on the data that we get in that correction phase, then we can turn around on the back end and decide um, what's going to be better for the student or better for the situation or better for the teacher all around when we decide what consequence is going to be meaningful and which consequence is going to be logical. And so when we think about consequences, most of the time the consequences lead us to two paths. We've got a consequence outcome path and we have an accountabilities outcome path. Right now, the way our system is set up, typically when um, I feel a referral or a kid does something wrong in school, we, we, we usually land here with the consequence outcome. And in the consequence outcome, these are the questions that I'm usually asking. What rule was broken? 
Who broke this rule? And ultimately, what should the punishment be? Now, on my campus years ago, when this was the path that we were taking, that led us to 1,149 types of suspension in one school year with a, with a, with a school, middle school with 1,000 kids in it. And typically across the nation, as I work with, with other administrators and I work with other campuses, this is typically the path that people are taking and we're coming out on the back end with a consequence. But when we think about accountability, we really wanna slow down and asking a different set of questions helps us get to the point where we can hold each other accountable and we can get a kid to think and reflect a little differently. And so those questions are pretty simple. It's what happened, who's been affected, and ultimately what needs to be done to make this right. And if we can get kids to reflect and think on those things and get adults on board to work together, then eventually um, we can get to the point of meaningful accountability where those things or those consequences that we choose are both meaningful and they're both logical. And so one of the things when you talk about implementation and that um, I've been noticing as, as I kind of travel and, and working with different groups, um, there's, this, there's this idea that what we're trying to do with restorative practices isn't the real world. And when I, when I mean real world, it, it's, it, they, it, there's this misnomer out there that we're not truly preparing our kids for the real world by taking them through these um, processes because people think this is a soft approach. Um, but when you think about it and, and, you, and you put it together, um, what we're doing with kids right now in school to me isn't the real world. And as an adult, as you sit here and you reflect and you think about it, like how many times as an adult have you served a three-day suspension? Or how many times as an adult have you been placed um, in ISS for a half a day? Like those things, they don't, they don't equate with what we're doing with our kids and consequences. As an adult, we, we want to become aware of the impact of our behavior. We've become aware of the uh, impact of our behavior. And uh, we, we're, we take steps to make things right. And these are the skills that our kids need. Like I, I joke all the time when I, when I talk with people about this I, and I, you know, I talk about my wife and I talk about this process and I, and I think of it this way, like, you know, if I got into it with my wife and we had an argument, a, 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 a breakdown in relationship at home and um, you know, I came home and she was like, no, absolutely not. Like you're suspended from the house three days. Like I, I might just, be like, okay, and I'd go and, and catch a basketball game with my friends or maybe go out and hang out. Um, and typically that's what's happening with our kids. Um, you know, we suspend them thinking that that's gonna send the message and then ultimately it doesn't send the message. Um, they go, they play Xbox, they, they, they're out with their friends and they come back to school and they do the same exact thing. And then we're pulling our hairs out, um, trying to figure out why. And ultimately it's because we didn't give them the opportunity to hold themselves accountable um, because the methodology that we have built into our system doesn't allow for it. And so thinking of it this way, and we talked about where, we're, where we are now and where we want to end up. Um, when you think about traditional practices versus restorative practices, right now we're in a place where everything that we do is based on a violation of rules. And we want to go from the violation of rules ultimately to the violations of relationships. Um, everything can be broken down to a violation of relationship. Um, you know, when two people, um, you know, if something is, 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 is stolen or someone hurts someone else's feelings, that's a violation of relationship. The accountability factor is going to be to the relationship, not necessarily to the rule. And so when you think about it this way, we're trying to go from the violation of rules more so to the violation of relationships. The next piece is this, our system as it currently sits doesn't um, leave a lot of opportunity for remorse making. Um, and this process gives us every opportunity um, for those remorse making opportunities. Um, in our, our current system right now, we say that accountability equals punishment. So because two kids got into an argument, got into a fight or whatever it is, we give them a consequence of a half day ISS or a three day suspension or whatever it is. And we say that that punishment should essentially teach them the lesson. And we're finding out that more, more times than none, that's not happening because they're coming back and they're doing the same thing. But this, uh, this process gives us accountability a different name. Um, it gives us um, and the kids an opportunity to understand the behavioral impact and gives us an opportunity to repair the situation when they can. Ultimately, this process boils down to these two things. Typically in school right now, we just expect that our kids should know, especially in high school. Our kids who are juniors and seniors, to me, they're just bigger third graders. And we just expect that they should know what's happening. But quite honestly, we have to teach 
the appropriate behavior. We have to teach what treatment looks like. We have to teach the things that um, we want them to uh, you know, be a part of, but at the same time, we want them to, to understand the expectations, but we have to teach those expectations. We just can't assume that uh, they know those exp expectations. There's also a misunderstanding out there that this process is only for troubled kids. It's just for the students who are causing us um, issue. You know, that 90, the, the, the 90%, uh, the, the student, 10 percent of the population that we spend 90 percent of our time with. Um, but this process for everybody, everybody gets an opportunity to connect with the adults in the building. Um, if there is a breakdown in the relationship, um, they get the opportunity to correct that breakdown and ultimately get an opportunity to hold themselves accountable through a meaningful um, consequence. And so just a couple of few, a few more misconceptions when we kind of go through this. Um, restorative practices ultimately isn't a quick fix. And a lot of people come to this process thinking that if they do a few things or they make a few changes that all of a sudden the kids are just going to, you know, change. Um, and, I, and I say that wholeheartedly up front because I wouldn't want your expectations to lead to disappointment. This takes work. Um, you have to slow down and you've got to work with kids and it takes a mindset shift to do some things differently. Um, ultimately, this isn't a behavior program. This is a process. Um, and I get it. You know, people say well, that's a behavior program or this is a, be you know, a behavior uh, intervention kind of thing. But more so, this is a process. We want our kids to go through this and we're going to do it with them. We're not going to do it to them, which means that the adults play a very prevalent role in it. Ultimately, restorative practices are not weak without consequences. Um, we just talked about consequences a few minutes ago. I'm a huge proponent of consequences. I think, if anything, we need more consequences, um, but those consequences have to be meaningful and those consequences have to be logical. Um, and again, you know, I hear this again, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, to change mindsets and we're trying to do things a little differently. And people say that this is just another gimmick. Um, I would argue differently, having experienced this for three years as a middle school administrator, um, I went to it uh, at first thinking this was just another gimmick to try to kind of, you know, uh, pacify the kids. But ultimately, this game changer for me as an administrator. Um, and it, it truly gave me my why back as to why I was, a, uh, I was an administrator, why I was teaching and why I was working with kids. And so this really has the opportunity to be the game changer for us. Um, but we just have to be able to work together and work through it with our students. And then ultimately, restorative practices are designed to build maintain and repair relationships. This is not designed to change behavior. Change behavior is a byproduct of better relationships, but this process, the way it's built, is designed to do that. It's designed to build better relationships. And so ultimately what we're trying to do through this process is that we're trying to create environments similar to these environments. And so I'm gonna switch screens here for a second and I'm gonna play a video for you um, but this is the environments that we're trying to create. And so thinking about those environments uh, that we're trying to create, um, I think it boils down to what he says there at the very end, um, him saying, you know, my, my school has now become a place of support. Um, and thinking about the environments that we're trying to create, that's why it's so important for us to build relationships with our students um, and be proactive on the front end as much as possible so that we can create those environments where our kids 
want to be. I had somebody the other day uh, talk to me a little bit about, you know, what are ways to curb absenteeism and, and, and to deal with uh, attendance. And I think wholeheartedly it begins on the front end very proactively. And, and I asked her this question. I was like, are we creating environments um, where kids want to be, where they look forward to being there and that their needs um, in support are ultimately being met? met? And so this is ultimately where the, this idea of this care plan comes into place. And so we talked a little bit about earlier during the expect, uh, what you can expect from the session, but the care plan is, is kind of broken down into four, four, four phases like this. And this is all proactive things. And so you have a circle. circles we've got proactive circles and then we have reactive circles and we're going to talk about the proactive circles and what those circles look like in the classroom um, to, to help build relationships and so what what is a circle and why are we using um, circles in the classroom so looking at it this way um, circles are used to build relationships um, we sit with a talking piece we talk and it's very structured in a way um, that's almost like a lesson um, but the, when, we, when we train our teachers, we, we teach them specifically how to go into the circle and how to get the most out of a circle by building relationships um, with the kids, by asking questions about who they are, things that they like, um, things that they dislike, um, just really trying to understand a little bit about them. When we think about circle and you break it down this way, um, it gives our opportunity for our teachers to learn about the students, students to learn about their teachers, and ultimately the students to learn about one another. And this is where that idea of empathy um, is born. But at the same time, the more that we know about each other, the more apt that we are to work with one another. And so circles give all of our students a voice. Every kid gets an opportunity um, to share what's on their mind or not share what's on, what's on their mind, all depending on the question and all depending on how comfortable they feel in the process. Um, circle creates a safe place for dialogue and connection making. And uh, this gives our kids, like I said, the opportunity this gives um, our kids the opportunity um, to kind of go through and make sure that they're dialoguing, but they're making connections with their kids. And so the next piece is this, um, and we use this proact I mean, uh, we, we use it proactively to build relationships, but we also use it to resolve conflict um, on the backside, um, on the reactive side, which we'll talk about during the, uh, the uh, correct phase and the consequence phase, which essentially our administrators are responsible for. So thinking of it this way, um, it helps our kids, you know, ultimately work on their soft skills. Um, they get the opportunity to uh, put a talking piece in their hand and they get the opportunity to speak in front of their peers. They get an opportunity to share um, the, their, their thoughts and their feelings. Um, and it just gives them and empowers them with the opportunity to do that. And so a couple of misconceptions about Circle. First and foremost, is we don't do Circle to try to uncover our kids' deep, darkest secrets, all right? Circle um, is not therapy and circling is not counseling. Uh, what we're trying to do is really get to our kids and trying to really understand muted they are circle isn't a tool to evaluate them though uh, we give the kids an opportunity to speak um, what they when they share they share that's their answer um, and ultimately we hope that it it, it leads to the, uh, uh, the 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 positive dialogue that we're trying to build into the classroom um, again circle is not a tool to force kids to share the more comfortable the kid feels the more apt they are to share, and it is okay for them to pass um, if a question isn't for them. Circle is not designed to change the child's behavior. And you know, I was talking with some elementary school teachers that we, I was working with uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, their, their response when we were talking about goals and grows was that, you know, we've done several circles with our kids this month, um, but their behavior seems not to be changing. And my response to them was, well, what um, are you hoping that, what, what are you hoping the circle was going to do? 
um, because ultimately the circle isn't going to change the child's behavior. What's going to change the child's behavior is the idea of are we building a strong relationship with them so that they don't want to disappoint and violate that relationship, which leads me to the next piece right here. Circle does not replace classroom management. If anything, if we struggle in classroom management, um, circle is going to um, uh, kind of expose us even more. And so it doesn't replace it. If anything, it's a supplement to what we're already trying to do. And so typically when I train teachers, I teach two, two types of circles. I teach a quick circle and I teach a formal circle. And you can notice that the quick circle is just an abbreviated form of the formal circle. And the reason that we've created this abbreviated form is because let's just be real, in schools, um, we don't typically have time to sit for 25 and 30 minutes. Um, some of the elementary schools that we're working with, they've actually built in time into their master schedules um, to have these opportunities to build relationships with their kids in circle. Um, but ultimately, if you're a teacher or you're an administrator and you're trying to do this on the fly, we recognize that time um, sometimes can be constrained. And so the quick circle is a way for us to quickly build relationships with our kids um, without utilizing all of the formalities um, in the formal circle. But the formal circle is the purest form of the process um, and it's consistent with fidelity to a traditional model. Um, but both circles share a common goal and ultimately that is to build um, relationships. So I, I see that it says, we're sorry, but it appears we have lost sound. Emily, you no, want to jump in? You're, nope, you're good. You're good. We had a temporary glitch a little bit back, um, but, but you've right. been on, on for a while now. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right, thank you. And so that's a little bit about Circle. Um, let's kind of transition over to uh, affirmation language and effective language. Um, I, I put these two stars in the presentation today because I think this is very important. Uh, typically, when we interact with our kids, um, we, we're going to interact with them non-verbally first, and then we're going to interact with them verbally. And then when we interact with them verbally, um, there's two things that happen. Primarily, um, I call that the primary behavior. So let's just say that I ask a kid to do something and I've interacted with them a certain kind of way. That primary behavior, that primary action, or that primary request that I'm doing um, is how I'm interacting with them first. But then whatever happens next is the secondary behavior. Typically what gets a teacher um, all in, uh, or an, an administrator all in, in, in our feelings is that secondary behavior. Um, primarily, if I go ask a kid to do something and they do it, everything is great. The secondary behavior was compliance and it worked. But if I deal with the kid and um, you know something simple like put your cell phone away and they don't do it, well, whatever happens next is the secondary behavior. And sometimes that secondary behavior is what really drives our emotions as the educator. And so we've gotta be aware of not only the primary behavior, but we can't let the secondary behavior when we work with our kids um, take us to our dark sides, if you will. And so thinking about effective statements and thinking about effective language um, is really taking that secondary um, behavior and then referring it right back to the primary behavior so that we can converse and work with the kid in a way um, that focuses on the behavior and not the intrinsic worth of the child. Um, these, these statements have to be strategically delivered and personalized, and we have to put the needs of the student um, before everything, and we have to figure out what's causing the behavior. But I'm not going to do that in a way that gasses the situation. I'm going to do that in a way that enhances the situation where I can use my words to drive the conversations. And so thinking about effective statements, it's really simple. Those of you who are on the, 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 uh, the webinar who are, uh, are familiar with um, effective statements or I feel statements, um, when you think about past or positive affirmation sentence stems, um, these are two that we're working or we're teaching teachers to kind of default to um, when working with the kid with adverse um, kind of behaviors. And so it's, it's basically just that. It's I feel and then whatever you're feeling uh, when a certain occurrence occurs. Um, and so I've given two separate sentence stems there, but on that second one that's pink, um, I've added something towards the end. It's two things. It's the reason um, why I'm feeling that way. And ultimately, I like to add, I like to end with an appreciation. So something to the effect of like, you know, I feel excited when you come to class on time, right? Because it lets me know that you're excited about my class or you're excited about your education. I really appreciate you for doing that. 
And it's something about those affirmations. It's something about making kids feel good about doing the right thing um, that we're hoping continues or that we're seeing makes them continually want to do the right thing without having to result to giving them trinkets and nuggets and like that. It's really more of an intrinsic motivation to kind of do the right thing. And so that's a little bit about circle. That's a little bit about aff uh, affirmation language. Um, the relationship agreement for us, um, and I know I'm going through this pretty quick, um, but it's all kind of uh, broken down and in, in further in, in the guide. But when you think about the relationship agreement, this is really the uh, game changer for us um, with working with students. This, um, in a lot of the classrooms that I'm working with, and especially dealing with working with my administrators, a lot of the administrators have made this a non-negotiable um, that every single classroom on their campus has what they call a relationship agreement. And this is truly where the teachers and the students are talking about what respect looks like. They're talking about what treatment looks like. And they're using this four uh, quadrant model to make, um, to, to kind of come to grips as to, or come to an, an agreement rather, as to what those things look like. And so if you can kind of see my mouse move a little bit, it's four quadrants here. You got students treating students. And so this is what the students are saying that they need from one another. Um, over here in those right quadrants, you've got students treating the teachers. And so this is what the teachers are saying that they need from their students in treatment. In this third quadrant, and this is really the game changer quadrant, is because typically we tell kids what, they, what we need from them, but we don't really ask kids what they need from us. And this um, relationship agreement gives our kids just a, a voice to kind of share what it is that they're looking um, as far as um, treatment from the adult that's teaching them or the adult that's in the classroom. And so like these particular students here, they've asked their teacher to be friendly, to be fun, to give compliments. Um, this is kind of funny, right? It says, don't yell at us. But that's something that kids feel like they don't come to school to be yelled at. Um, help us when we need it. Love, love, love us like your own child. How about that? Because again, restorative practices is just good parenting. Um, and we, you know, when you're thinking about uh, the kids and how much time we spend with them, sometimes we spend more time with the kids in our classrooms than we do with our own kids during the, uh, during the, the semester. Um, have a nice attitude, use manners, be happy when we learn and never give up on us. And so taking into consideration what our kids are really saying is a way that we can foster that relationship if I work together with the kids on trying to accomplish that environment that we're building in the classroom. Um, and then this last question here is how are we going to treat the facilities? Um, and you know, you can see there, we wanna clean up after ourselves and those kinds of things. And so this has truly been the game changer for our teachers when they're talking about um, you know, treatment in the classroom. And so thinking of it this way, it promotes a common language around treatment. Um, the relationship agreement increases accountability for students and the adult, and it gives students a voice. Um, it allows for healthy um, relationship-centered redirection and creates a platform for setting relationship goals. And so thinking about it like this, many of the times as an educator, we wanna to default to using respect here somewhere. Um, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. It's just respect is a very large word. It's a very broad statement, um, but we have to really define what respect is so then we can hold our kids accountable um, to those things um, more exact than if we just put up there um, respect. And so that's a little bit about the relationship agreement kind of in a nutshell, um, again, in the guide, uh, in, in, the, in the NPR guide that we have published, it teaches you how to create it, how to go about and making it with your kids, how to put it up on the wall, how to use it um, as, a, as a weekly check-in and how to develop relationship goals um, around it um, as you go week to week working with the kids. Um, the next piece is uh, about emotional awareness. Um, one of the biggest pushes right now in the country is this idea of social and emotional learning. Um, let's just be real, kids aren't going to learn in the classroom um, unless they feel, um, you know, like, like they belong, that they feel like, um, you know, people have their best interest at heart. And so thinking about their emotional awareness or paying attention to their emotional awareness um, really gives us the opportunity as an educator to kind of get on the inside, um, you know, meet their needs. And at the same time, uh, you know, teach them replacement behaviors and such for when they are feeling a certain kind of way. And so if you do a quick Google search, there are a lot of things that are happening in the nation where people are, are, are using colors, um, they're using feeling words, they're using emojis. Um, these are a couple of examples here to your right, um, but how kids are using words to describe and colors to describe how it is that they are feeling. Um, and then the teachers and the administrators are, are, are offering replacement behaviors, they're offering um, cool down spots, they're offering safe zones for our kids to, to deal with that anger, to deal with those emotions, and then get themselves back to equilibrium so they can get back into the classroom and that they can continue to learn. 
So that's a little bit about emotional awareness. And again, the uh, guide breaks that down a little further with some other um, you know, nuggets as to how you can kind of do some of those things in the classroom or into the, into the school building. And so that's, a little, that's the care plan. Essentially, um, proactively, when we teach teachers or we work with teachers, we typically just teach them the care plan. Um, they get all the tools to do circle. They, know, they learn how to write circle, um, perform circle. They learn how to do everything there is to do with circle. Um, we teach them how to use effective statements, the effective language, to role play. Um, ultimately, we teach them how to build and create the relationship agreement and how to use that as the center focus of the classroom to talk about treatment. And then we look at how do we create different uh, uh, metrics or matrices about emotional intelligence and how we can put those things um, to work for our kids and our teachers in the classroom. And so I want to transition from the connect plan over to the next piece, which is really the land of the administrator, um, which is the correct plan. And so when you think about the correct plan, that's that second piece in the middle. The correct plan is designed to help our kids get to that idea of meaningful accountability and where we can uh, dismiss exclusionary consequences and choose consequences that are meaningful and logical. And so thinking of it this way, when we consider the correct phase, there's a bunch of things to think about. Um, ultimately, the correct phase is rooted in the four F's model, which is the facts, the feelings, the fix, and the future. And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but when we break this down and we work with our kids, um, essentially driven by those four questions that are right there. And so when we think about the four C's in the correct phase, we're going to collect the facts by asking questions like, what happened? Who's been impacted? Um, as we move more towards the feelings, we're going to consider, you know, how did these things make us feel? How did it make the other person feel? And what has been the hardest part for us in this process? As we work towards correcting the situation or the fix, we're asking our students and we're asking our adults or the people who are involved in the process, what needs to be done to make it right? What are you willing to do to make it right? And how can we correct the situation? And then it leads us to preventive measures in the future, which is how are we gonna continue from here? So in the future, what can we do to keep this from happening again? What does everyone need? And ultimately, when should we check in? And so that's a little bit about the correct phase and how we're asking those questions in circle to gain intel um, from our kids so that we can decide what it is that we need to do with our kids on the backside when it's time to choose a consequence. And if our kids are, 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 are um, you know, if our kids feel as though, or if we feel that the kids are, are taking responsibility for their actions, have come up with ways to, to fix and repair the situation, then that gives us enough intel that we need on the backside so that we can work and work through a consequence for them that's meaningful and that's logical. And so this is a couple of reasons why we would kind of enact a restorative chat or a restorative circle. A um, few of those reasons is this. Uh, we want to work through an officer referral. Um, we want to repair harm, resolve, resolve conflict. Um, typically, we want to reintegrate someone back into the community. Maybe they left they've come back or maybe they've left because they've gone to an alternative school kind of situation, but they're back now and we wanna reintegrate them. Um, to support our, our, our extra or intensive uh, behavior students. Um, and typically through a family group conference, we can bring our families together to solve conflict or repair harm. And over here to the right, we've got a couple of preparation tips. We just wanna make sure that the facility can ensure, the facilitator can ensure everyone's safety, um, that the pre-conferences are being held with all parties so that everybody knows what's going to happen and that they've come to the, to the table together to kind of make sure that, um, to, 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 to make sure that we're trying to reach the same goal. Um, we wanna invite all parties to stake in the situation. We wanna find appropriate times and locations. And ultimately we wanna make sure that we're using our talking pieces, we're determining guidelines. And then if we need extra materials that we have those uh, readily available to us. And so really quickly, that's the correct, you know, it's rooted in the four Fs the facts, the feelings, the fix, the future. We're gonna collect those facts, consider the feelings, correct the fix, and ultimately continue um, in the future. And so we've got two of the processes. We wanna break down this last process here, which is the consequence plan. Um, and it's rooted in four C's as well. And so when we think about the consequence plan, um, we wanna contemplate the facts. We wanna confirm the data that we got during the, co the correct phase. We wanna choose a strategy. And ultimately we wanna figure out what consequence is going to be meaningful and accountability and do we need to result to an exclusionary consequence to teach the lesson and so the way it breaks down is like this we've got to realize that restorative practices does not replace consequences i can't emphasize that enough um well, what it is going to do is help our kids reach that level of meaningful accountability and we want to take them through the phase so when we take the kids through the correct phase as an administrator on the back end i'm left to kind of fill the, the pieces or fill the gap. I'm responsible for responding. 
And so this gives me a protocol to respond. And so these are the questions that I would be asking myself um, in isolation. And so when I went through the correct phase, what facts was I able to uncover? What was I able to learn about the situation? And ultimately, who was impacted? When I confirm, it's the things that I've learned. So what does the past data say about this student? What were the remorse levels? Were they willing to make things right? And what type of attitude was present for accountability? If we go into this process and the kid's not willing to do anything to make things right or not willing to accept responsibility, then it's simple. We just go ahead and we play the exclusionary consequence that we would always play normally. Um, but if a kid does exhibit remorse levels or exhibits the willingness to make things right, then we can take a different path. And this is what I talked about earlier, the path to accountability or to the path to a consequence. And then again, um, you know, we're going to have the opportunity now to, to choose a fix and to see what needs to be done to help the situation. But ultimately, when we think about the future, we've got to consider, will a traditional consequence help our kids do better? And will the consequence that we're going to give lead to better relationships and the needs kind of being met? And so when we think about the consequence phase, we want to make sure that we choose our outcomes. I'm sorry, we want to choose our strategies first, and then we want to we want to choose our outcomes first, and then we want to choose our strategies. And then when we think about strategies and outcomes, these are a few questions right here that we can add. Um, you know, what do we want our students to understand about the situation? What changes would we like to see in their behavior? Will a punishment teach them to be more empathetic or thoughtful? And what do others need from the situation? And so we want to consider all these things when we start choosing strategies to meet the outcomes that we want and change behavior. And so when you look at the whole process like this, those are the three phases we connect in the classroom by doing the care plan with those four components. And then as we sit and we try to work through and correct situations and, and work through um, situations where, where there's been a violation of relationship, we want to consider the facts, the feelings, the fix, the future. And then ultimately, we want to decide, can we um, find through the data that we've uncovered during the correct plan, can we find opportunities to hold our kids um, accountable um, both meaningfully and both logically. And so thinking of it, putting it all together, that's essentially the connect, the correct, and the consequence plan as far as the process of restorative practices. And so as we kind of push forward, um, because I know that our, our time is, 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 is limited, I, I kind of want to end with this idea. Um, there's, an, I, there's this whole, I, this whole process um, is rooted in this idea of belonging, um, but it's rooted in, in, in data. And so when you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, as an educator, I think we, it's, it's without saying that a kid isn't going to learn math, reading, science, or social studies um, if they don't have their physiological needs met, uh, they don't feel safe, um, and, and, and they, they don't feel like they belong, because ultimately where we want them to land is here in these self-esteem needs. And this is where our kids feel that sense of accomplishment. Um, this is where you know, they master the content, they recognize, and they respect us. Um, but there's this false logic behind exclusion. And, and so when you think about the false logic behind exclusion, what we're telling our kids um, through exclusion is that we've taken these two steps here and we've switched them. And what we're telling our kids is that in order for you to feel accomplished, right, you, before you can belong here, you got to accomplish something. You got to you got to recognize you have to respect you have to manage what you're doing. You have to manage everything before you can get to the point here. So we've taken these two things and we've kind of switched them. And we're telling our kids that in order for them to belong, they have to first achieve for us rather than telling kids that they belong. Therefore, it'll lead to our achievement. And it boils down to this, because when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. And too many times in our system, what we've done is we try to correct the kids so much um, and we don't take into consideration what our environments are doing and our environments, are they causing some of these, um, these things? And so thinking about this quote and thinking about the environments that we build, um, like I said, I've been traveling um, the, between, you know, the, the nation essentially um, talking about this idea of belonging, this idea of can we um, build these environments in our uh, schools where kids want to be, where they feel as the teachers have their best interest at heart. Um, and I, I, I was home, and this is my brother, this is Ronnie Lott. Uh, Ronnie's a hip-hop artist, and what I tasked him with doing, and when I say he's a hip-hop artist, he's a, a starving hip-hop artist, um, but what I tasked him to do is um, I tasked him to create a song based on the first-person um, 
viewpoint of a kid who's in our buildings and is struggling. And so I'd like to play that song for you, um, just thinking about if you could reflect on some of the students that you see um, day in and day out in your classrooms, um, and is this potentially how they're feeling?
And so when we think about the kids who are coming to our classrooms and coming to our schools every single day, we've got to really recognize and we have to really consider, um, you know, who they are and what they bring to the table and can we work through some of the hardships that they bring and can we create those environments and restorative practices gave me the opportunity as an administrator to create those environments and to be able to work with our kids outside of the box in the non-traditional form because ultimately what we do matters um, but it's why we do it that matters so much more and so um, as we end today's uh, webinar I, I, I just really want to thank everybody for joining us um, uh, Emily talked a little bit about who we are and what it is that we're trying to accomplish with the Comprehensive School Solutions Group um, and, you know, NPR being one of the leaders in um, working with our with, with, with educators um, with decades of experience and making those things happen. Um, again, well, we are going to pause a little bit and we'll take some time to, to answer questions um, that we're going to, because I'm going to send this back to Emily. But please, if you get the opportunity, um, check out the restorative practices outside the box approach to building and sustaining relationships in schools. I know that we, we went through this very quickly today, but it takes you um, through the, the, the facets of the process um, where you can slow down and kind of get a better understanding of what's going on. So I personally thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule and away from your families to do that. And I want to turn it back over to Emily, um, our webinar host. So thank you, Emily. Thank you, Rufus. This was wonderful. And um, thank you for ending with that song. I think that really put a lot of things in perspective. Um, and uh, I think also harkened back to the um, poster that you showed where the students were asking of the teachers to not give up on us. Um, and I think that's such a critical point um, of all of this. So um, as Rufus said, I did just want to thank um, our sponsor for today, which is NPR, and they are the publishers of Rufus's Guide, Restorative Practices, and Outside Box Approach to Building and Sustaining Relationships. So as Rufus said, we encourage you to go out um, to the nprinc.com website to um, look at that guide, um, as well as the hundreds of other incredibly useful resources to support your practice uh, that you'll find out on the NPR site. Um, so spend some time checking that out and um, seeing what NPR has to offer in addition to that wonderful guide. Um, we do just have a few minutes left, and so we will get to a couple questions. Um, before we get to those, I did want to remind everyone you will get a copy of the recording and the slide deck. Um, Rufus did go through things super fast, and there was a lot of content on those slides, and you will get access to them um, via email in the next day or two. Um, so you can look at them more closely as well as share them with your colleagues. Um, so we'll just take a couple questions um, before we run out of our time together. Um, so first, Rufus, um, can you maybe explain um, what the difference is between restorative justice and restorative practice, if there is a difference? Sure. Um, there, there really isn't a difference. Uh, it, it's, it's just it's, it's what a name is. Um, we've kind of evolved from restorative justice. Um, when we brought this to my campus uh, four years ago as a pilot, um, we, we called it restorative discipline. Um, we found that, you know, there's something about that word discipline. You, you, you can't change the connotation in education with the word discipline. Typically, it means some kind of consequence or some kind of punishment. And so we kind of evolved from restorative justice, calling it restorative justice to restorative discipline. And now we just call it restorative practices. Um, and lately, we've just really been calling it relational practices because it's about building and sustaining relationships. Um, but typically across the nation, more so on the West Coast, um, they tend to call it restorative justice. Um, but it's all the same thing. Um, we've just kind of broken it down and kind of, you know, made it more of a thing that we do with kids um, and it's a process. And so thinking about it being proactive and thinking about it being reactive. And so we talk about restorative justice, restorative discipline, restorative practice. It's all the same thing. It's just the uh, just known as different things in different parts of the country. OK, that was helpful. Thank you. Um, do you have any data um, or anecdotal data <laughs> um, from your former school or the schools you work with now um, about the impact of restorative practice on test scores or other academic achievement measures? Um, there's a there's a lot of research um, uh, out, out um, in, in the in, in you know on, online in different places um, that talk about the uh, impact of uh, putting relationships at the center of the interactions with kids, um, but at the same time putting relationships before content. Um, the, there is some anecdotal data. I, I would uh, recommend that uh, people visit the uh, UT Austin um, Institute for uh, Restorative uh, Justice and Dialogue. Um, they're the ones who did actually did the study on our campus um, years back um, when we did this as a three-year pilot. But I can tell you that um, just right off the bat, we saw decreases in suspensions. We saw decreases in ISS placements. Um, but not only that, the increases were, um, were seen in our academics because we were a campus um, who struggled uh, to meet federal and state accountability. Um, and just by putting relationships um, at the center of all of interactions, 
by talking with our kids differently, by putting the relationship agreements up on the wall and having those conversations, um, we were able to grow um, and receive distinctions in the state of Texas, um, both in the 13, 14, 14, 15, and the 15, 16 school year, um, when, when we were a campus that couldn't even meet accountability um, in the area of math, reading, social studies, and then being in the top 25% um, in growth from one year to the next, as a title campus in the state of Texas. And so there's a lot of data. Um, I, I would challenge people to go out there and, 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 and read um, you know, the different data and thing that different research and things that people are saying out in the country. Um, but my school isn't the only model. Um, there's, there's plenty of things out in the San Francisco Unified School District um, out that way where people can go and, and see some things. Great, thank you. I mean, that, that anecdotal data was great um, in hearing your own experience. So yes, I'm sure there is a lot more um, data and other models people can explore. So unfortunately, we have run out of our time with you um, and it has been a pleasure spending time with you and hearing um, the information that you have to share. Uh, so thank you, Rufus, for taking your time to be with us and thanks everyone in the audience for um, spending some time with us. Um, and again, thank you to our sponsor NPR and keep an eye out on your um, email inbox either tomorrow or Friday uh, with a link to the um, presentation as well as the recording. Um, so have a great afternoon or evening, everyone, depending on where you are in the country. And um, we look forward to um, connecting with you again um, at another webinar at a later date. All right. Thank you, guys.